So, good morning, everybody, and thanks to everybody who had a hand in inviting me here, and thanks to all of you who took the trouble to come. It is just amazing to see all these old friends and new friends. So I look forward to sitting and talking and having, it, having, to, to, having a, a chance to hear what's going on in the world. I also just have to say it's just amazing to come to Singapore and, and see such a vibrant community. It, sort of, it reminds me in a little way of my favorite city, Zurich in Switzerland, and the, the ETH, the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, the, 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 what was originally just a technical engineering college, who's just grown into a world-class university. And the same thing happening here. It's a similar situation. You have a, a very poor and small country with people who have to work hard to make a living and just have made an enormous success of things. And I just congratulate Singapore and congratulate all of you for doing such a wonderful job. I must apologize for talking about a technical subject. I wanted to talk about my own field and about real science, not just philosophizing. I, <laughs> so it will all be equations. And for those who don't enjoy equations, I just I, I invite you to go and, 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 and enjoy a, a cup of coffee outside. <laughs> so here are some citations of the literature. It all starts with this wonderful paper of Bohr and Rosenfeld in the year 1933, which was a very famous piece of work in which Bohr, it, this, this was the fi sort of finest example of Bohr's style. It's a very, very uh, long and complicated argument written in very long and convoluted German sentences. And the unfortunate Rosenfeld had to write it all down 14 times before Bohr was willing to let it go to be published. So it went through 14 versions. And so the title was On the Question of the Measurability of the Electromagnetic Field Strengths. And it is the, it's the foundation of the field of quantum electrodynamics. It's the paper in which Bohr found the, the precise physical basis for the quantum treatment of electromagnetism, showing that just if you had electromagnetic waves interacting with material objects, and then if the apparatus behaved the rules of quantum mechanics, then the rules of quantum electrodynamics were then a necessary consequence. That is what Bohr and Rosenfeld established. So what I'm trying to do today is to discuss the same problem for gravitation. That's where this all starts. So how about gravitation? Is it, in fact, like electrodynamics? In electrodynamics, of course, we, we have the classical theory of Maxwell, and we have the quantum theory, which started with Einstein, the theory of the photon, which is the particle of electromagnetism. And the two things, the classical and the quantum picture, are linked together by this subject, which is called quantum electrodynamics. Does the same thing hold for gravity? In, that is the big question, which we don't yet know to answer. And there's been a great deal of talk, a great deal of philosophizing, and not very much detailed science, and I shall try to talk about the detailed science today. In the case of gravitation, you have the classical theory of Einstein, of general relativity, which describes gravitation beautifully as a classical phenomenon in the classical world. Waves of gravitation propagating through a universe with equations which have enormous elegance and enormous predictive power and has been verified by observation. So it's a firmly based classical theory. On top of that, 
you have what's called quantum gravity, which is the notion that actually there exists a particle called the graviton, which has the same relation to classical gravity as the photon has to the Maxwell theory. But there's no observational evidence for that. Do gravitons actually exist? We don't know. Nobody has ever seen a single graviton. So that's the subject which I'm going to discuss. Roughly speaking, there are three possible alternatives which might describe the universe we live in. There's first of all what I would call the, the orthodox view, the view of all the experts, which is that quantum gravity is a good theory just like quantum electrodynamics, that in fact there do exist gravitons and that they obey the equations of quantum gravitation quantum gravity, and they have the same, base, the same kind of behavior as the photon, except that it's harder to observe. So that's the first possibility. The second possibility is what I call concealment, which is that quantum gravity exists, but it can never be detected in the same way that the quark exists. That there's a, a particle called the quark, which everybody believes is real, but it can never be observed. And that has turned out to be a very fruitful concept in particle physics, what's called qu quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of the strong interactions, which is based on quarks. So the quark is this uh, quantum field which has all the properties of a quantum field except observability that, in point of fact, you can never see a quark by itself. All you can see is confined systems in which the quarks are hidden. That's why we call it confinement. So that's the second possibility. So quantum gravity is real but unobservable. And the third possibility is that quantum gravity is nonsense. That, in fact, there is no such thing as quantum gravity. That uh, the gravity is a purely classical phenomenon, and uh, the alleged effects of quantization are just all of them, for some reason, absent. So it, it means that, uh, if that were true, Gravitation is a classical phenomenon. It is some kind of statistical property which only belongs to matter in the large, and not to matter in the small. So there's no such thing as the gravitational field of an electron. That, in fact, it's only a collective property of matter in bulk. So those are the three possibilities. And the question is, which I'm asking, is what is the evidence? What can we actually say from what we have observed? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So there are three, there are actually four subjects I'm going to discuss, which are first of all, the Ball Rosenfeld argument. What happens if you actually try to? apply the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument to gravitation. So that's the first question. So that's essential. That's just mathematics. It has an interesting answer. And then the second subject is a particular kind of gravitational observation, which is actually being done in the real world, which is called LIGO. LIGO stands for, what is it called? Uh, um, Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, I guess. It's, anyway, it's a long vacuum pipe with a mirror at each end and light bouncing up and down, up and down, up and down. And you measure very precisely the phase of the light as it comes back and forth and is reflected at the mirrors. So that's a, a very precise measurement of the distance between the two mirrors. Well, when a gravitational wave comes by, 
the gravitational wave is a distortion of the space. So it produces a very small change in the separation of the mirrors as it was measured by the light. So this is a detector for gravitational waves coming by. So the purpose of the apparatus is actually to detect classical gravitational waves coming from astronomical sources. If you actually look at the history of this apparatus, it's not very glorious. The apparatus has been working now for quite a number of years, five or 10 years, and it's never seen anything yet. There's always a hope that it will. And they're, they're going to upgrade it in the hopes that they can improve the sensitivity by a factor of 100. And with luck, there will, in fact, be a detection of a, gravi of a classical gravitational wave. That will be a big event. But the question I'm asking is, what about an apparatus of that kind? Could it actually detect a graviton? And the answer is no. So that's my first piece of evidence, that in principle, that kind of an apparatus would be incapable, even if it were as sensitive as it is possible to be, and even if the universe were totally quiet with no background of incidental noise, it would still not be possible to detect a single graviton. So, so that's quite a strong statement. That's evidence in favor of un unobservability of gravitons. The third subject is another kind of detector, and that is a detector consisting of a single atom. That's the analog of Einstein's photoelectric effect. Einstein invented the photon by considering what happens when an electromagnetic wave knocks an electron out of an atom. So you can ask the same question about gravitational wave. Suppose a gravitational wave hits an atom, also can knock out an electron, or it can knock out an, a proton or a neutron. That also could be observed. So that's another kind of graviton detector. And the answer there is maybe. You can't prove that that doesn't work, but it, uh, there's fairly strong evidence that it doesn't work. And the fourth subject I will discuss is another way of detecting gravitons, which is based on the coherent conversion of photons into gravitons, which is an interesting process invented by a Russian called Gerzenfeld, Gerzenstein, so here's the reference to Gerzenstein on the board, 1962. So it was an old paper, Wave Resonance of Light and Gravitational Waves. So what Gerzenstein showed is that in classical gravitation electromagnetic theory, there is this process of conversion of gravitons into photons or photons into gravitons, which you can calculate which gives you a method of detecting gravitons, if this actually happens. It's rather like the oscillation of neutrinos, which was recently discovered. That there are three different kinds of neutrinos, and they also can convert into each other by the same kind of coherent process. So it happens whenever you have a linear field, or rather two linear fields, which satisfy a, 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 a bilinear coupling equation, so they, each, they can convert coherently one into the other. So that's a, a, an, another way of possibly detecting gravitons. So I'll also discuss that. So there are altogether four different arguments. And in the end, the question remains open. Well, let me get down then to, to some of the details. So I guess the first equation is number 10. This is the, the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument. So what Bohr and Rosenfeld were talking about is the uncertainty relation 
for observations of electric and magnetic fields, showing that they had to be consistent with quantum electrodynamics. So delta, X, delta EX is the uncertainty of a measurement of electric field in some space-time region 1. And delta EX2 is the uncertainty in the measurement in a, another space-time region 2. And those two, there's this, this Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, which says the product of the uncertainties of the two measurements is at least as great as this quantity on the right, which is a purely classical quantity. And A12 is the electric field averaged over region 1, induced by a classical dipole in region 2. And A21 is the other way around. It's the classical dipole in region 2, induced by a dipole in region 1. So you take those two classical dipoles, subtract them, and that gives you the uncertainty in the measurement. So that was the result of the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument, which was a very sort of a verification that quantum electrodynamics had to be true if the classical apparatus you use for the measurement obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. Well, how about it? What happens when you apply that to gravitation? It all looks, the mathematics looks much the same. You have a, a similar sort of an equation you can write down with the uncertainty of measurement of gravitational fields with classical gravitational dipoles and or quadrupoles in this case. And so it looks as though it should be the same. But if you look at Bohr's argument, if you look carefully, you find there's one place where it's very tricky. The, the argument, in fact, requires a particular physical device, which is the compensation of the induced currents and charges. That Bohr is imagining you have these classical charges and currents, which are the measuring apparatus. And so they move in response to the electric field that you're measuring. But of course, when those classical charges move, they, in fact, induce then further fields which you cannot control. Those are the fields you're trying to measure. And that messes up your measurement. And in order to make the measurement as precise as possible, Bohr imagines that those induced charges and currents are compensated so you have another set of charges and currents exactly opposite to the ones you're using for the measurement, which compensate these fields that you're trying to measure, which enables the measurement then to be as precise as it should be. So that compensation requires that you, in, 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 you have this other piece of apparatus which carries charges and currents precisely opposite to the ones you're using for the measurement. Well, that you cannot do with gravitation. In the case of gravitation, you're using masses. You have to use masses to, to induce the gravitational forces that you're trying to measure. But there's no such thing as a negative mass. So this kind of a compensation cannot be done. So that just for that reason, the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument fails. Well, that's the, 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 that's the end of chapter one. That's the, the, so the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument simply doesn't apply to gravitation. So it may be true that quantum gravity has the right commutation rules, or it may not. But you can't prove it as Bohr did for the Maxwell equations. Well, now, the second subject is the LIGO. And here, I can actually prove a theorem. That's the only really strong statement I can make. It is actually a theorem that a, a detector of, of the design of a LIGO, that's two mirrors measuring the gravitational wave as it comes by, 
cannot in fact work for a single graviton. So here is the argument. It's, uh, it's, it's based on equations, I'm sorry to say. But anyhow, uh, so if you look at the en energy density of a gravitational field, this is the equation one, which if you have an, a gravitational field in which omega is the frequency and f is the fractional change in the metric. That's the fractional change in distance that's measured in consequence of the distortion of space by the gravitational field. So f is a pure number. It's just the fractional expansion or gravitation or expansion or contraction of the space measured. Then the energy density of the wave is given by this formula with the square of velocity of light c and the Newton's constant g. And the remarkable thing there is this square of the speed of light which comes in, which is an enormous factor. So it says that a very, very small distortion of the space produces a large energy density. So the exchange ratio between the observed distortion and the energy it takes is very large. The second equation is for a single graviton. If you take a graviton, which is frequency omega, it will have a, a certain energy density, which ca you can calculate. It carries the, the, en the, the energy of a graviton is just h omega, by, uh, according to, to Planck. And the volume, of, if it has a wavelength, which, which is c over omega, so the, the, the cube of the wavelength is roughly the volume of the, the, the minimum volume that the graviton could occupy. So the energy of a graviton is at most this quantity E sub s. So then if you put those two things together and you say one is equal to two, then you're talking about the energy density of a single graviton or the distortion of space corresponding to a single graviton, it's this quantity f in equation 3. And the quantity which comes in there is the Planck length. L sub f is the Planck length, which is uh, uh, in, because, again, of this large velocity of light, the Planck length is a very, very small number. 1.4 times 10 to minus 33 centimeters. So that is, in fact, then the standard distortion produced by a single graviton. It's the fact that that's so small which makes gravitons hard to observe. So you see the, the logic is very simple. So if you wanted to disturb a single graviton, we would have to measure the separation between these two mirrors with an accuracy which is equal to delta, which is just proportional to the Planck length and nothing else. Well, now comes in quantum mechanics for the apparatus. That if you, the, the apparatus is just the mirror, the, which has a mass capital M. So you look at equation six, that's the consequence of just of quantum mechanics. But if you have a mass, capital M, and it has an uncertainty in position, and it also has an uncertainty in velocity, as a if you try to hold it still for a length of time t, it will wobble around. It will have quantum fluctuations, which are of order delta, and that's the equation for the quantum fluctuations of the mirror. So m delta squared is at least Planck's constant times the time. So that's the best you can do for determining the position of a mirror over a time t. And the time t is at least the time it takes just for the light to go from one mirror to the other which is equal at, 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 at least the wavelength of the graviton you're trying to observe. 
So if you put those equations together, it's uh, 5 and 7, I guess, just, just the definition of delta. The, the precision you have to reach and the quantum mechanics. It, it, the, the answer comes out that the distance between the mirrors has to be less than gm over c squared. So Planck's constant has disappeared. You have not just an equation or inequality for the separation of the mirrors. The mirrors have to be close together depending on, only on their mass to make the measurement possible. And if you look at what that tells you, this quantity on the right, gm over c squared, is just the Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the mass of the mirror. So it's in fact, it's the radius of, of the black hole of that mass equal to the mass of the mirror. So if the, the mirrors are that close to each other, it means that each is attracted to the other with an irresistible force, and they both collapse into a black hole. So that's what nature does to prevent you making the experiment. Nature forbids the experiment by this very crude mechanism of, of forcing you. You are forced, forced to make the mirrors so heavy to make the quantum fluctuation small that they collapse into a black hole. So in the end, so it, it turns out that the, you can actually so prove mathematically that the apparatus is not going to work. This, this uh, argument so far assumes the mirrors are just suspended in space as free objects. In fact, that's the best you can do. The alternative would be to have them supported by some kind of elastic framework, but then it has to have a finite sound speed in the, in the mechanical framework. And then if, if you take